When I was in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago, I stopped at the International Spy Museum before leaving. I could have stayed there for hours, and it was incredible to see these gadgets and spy equipment that we normally only see in movies. But a set of pictures intrigued me. They were of both Union and Confederate soldiers during the Civil War using the topic of today's episode to spy on one another. Not only would they use this to observe the enemy, they were able to learn the terrain of the battlefield, take inventory, and even aim accordingly in the direction of the oncoming enemy. Oh, and this spy vehicle wasn't concealed at all. You're listening to The Story Behind, the extraordinary history of the ordinary. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is The Story Behind Balloons. But first, a quick message. If you're like me and start sentences with I heard on a podcast, you're going to love Podcast Brunch Club. It's like a book club, but for podcasts. Every month, a selection of podcasts are curated around a topic. All over the world, communities of podcast listeners get together to discuss that topic and the podcast they listen to. To see if there's a chapter near you, check out podcastbrunchclub.com. If there isn't one by you, but you'd like an excuse to get together with your podcast listening friends, you can also find out how to become a chapter leader. Plus, visit podcastbrunchclub.com to enter for a chance to win the story behind book. The winner of the giveaway will be chosen December 20th, so don't miss it. When I first started researching this topic, I was planning on grouping party balloons and hot air balloons into the same episode. But the stories behind both are incredibly interesting, and I wouldn't want to leave anything out. So for this episode, I'll focus only on party balloons and save hot air balloons for another episode in the future. The actual timeline of balloons deviates quite a bit, including from the very beginning. Aztec dried animal intestines and stomachs, blew them up and twisted them to make animal shapes, then set them on fire to offer to the gods. Mayans were using a sap from rubber trees and mixing it together to form the precursor to rubber. They made toy balls and dolls for children to play with out of the rubber. So it's weird that there are two origins for balloons, depending on how you look at it. The separate timelines don't stop there, and this is why hot air balloons will have to be a different episode. They were the result of the pursuit of flight and go in a different direction as the balloons we use today for parties. But aside from the insides of animals, party balloons started in the laboratory of Michael Faraday in 1824. Rubber had evolved to the point to be available commercially. Faraday put two sheets of rubber together, using flour to keep the middle and an end from sticking together. He was able to fill the rubber pocket with hydrogen for use in his experiments. At the time, the word balloon was already being used for the hot air variety, but before that, the term came from the Italian word pallone, or the French word ballone, meaning large ball. Balloon had also been a game played with a large leather ball since the 16th century. A year after Faraday's balloon idea took off, Thomas Hancock, a rubber trader, began selling a kit to make balloons in the home, which included liquid rubber and a syringe to fill with air. More than 20 years later, rubber was finally shaped into a balloon that could be blown up similarly to the way we do so today. J.G. Ingram was the first to use vulcanized rubber to make balloons. These are considered the prototype for the modern-day balloons we know today. Neil Tollettson invented the latex balloon in the 1920s, with the first shape being that of a cat, so of course it was popular. But he soon made balloons in other shapes. He also went on to invent latex gloves. Tillotson was only meant to be a bullet point in this story until I was looking through his obituary and saw he wasn't only known for his invention of the latex balloon, but something else caught my eye, so forgive the tangent. Although if you've been listening for a while, you're probably used to my internet rabbit holes by now. When Tillotson retired, he built the Balsam's Grand Resort Hotel in Dixville Notch, New Hampshire. Residents in Dixville Notch were very few and far between. Tillotson had plenty of room available to build a giant hotel because the unincorporated community of Dixville Notch is very sparsely populated. But that meant that during elections, those living there had to travel about 50 miles to the nearest polling place. Tillotson decided to shine some light on his new hometown and set up a polling location for the residents of Dixville Notch in 1960 for the election between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. New Hampshire's voting laws allow towns to close their polling locations if all eligible voters have voted. 
Tillotson gathered all eight other Dixville Notch residents to his hotel the eve of election night and made sure the press knew that everyone would be accounted for so that he could put the first ballot in when his watch struck midnight. The polls closed at 12.01 a.m. once everyone had voted, and Dixville Notch, New Hampshire, was the first in the nation to declare their election results. The tradition continued, and Tillotson was always the first vote until his death in 2001. But now the vote is decided by a random drawing from a chamber pot. Eligible voters show up at the hotel at midnight to vote, and they are traditionally the first in the nation to report their results. If I have any listeners from Dixville Notch, I feel like I need to meet you because right now you are my random town trivia celebrity. Balloon sales have dropped in the past few decades. Scientists are learning more about the effect balloons can have on the environment. When a latex balloon filled with helium, for example, is let go of into the atmosphere, it breaks into tiny slivers, which then fall to the ground and breaks down into the soil. That's if the balloon is made of natural latex, though, and most balloons are chemically treated, meaning they don't break down as easily. When those balloons eventually deflate or pop, they could be hazardous to sea animals who may mistakenly eat them, thinking it's food. According to the Balloon Council, no sea animal has ever died from eating a balloon. However, you may still want to steer clear of helium balloons for another environmental reason, the helium itself. Helium is a non-renewable resource, which means once the Earth runs out of it, it's gone forever. Now you may think that only affects the balloons you get for celebrations or parade floats, but in fact many scientists rely on helium, and it's used in medical industries, like in MRI machines. Helium can be recycled, but if you have a latex balloon, most likely the helium will slowly escape from the pores of the material by the next day. But since the 1920s, there has been a reserve of helium underground in Amarillo, Texas, back when blimps were being looked at for use by the military. But already more than 78% of the world's helium has already been extracted, and the helium is sold cheaply, despite the necessity of it. As for why your voice gets higher when you inhale the helium from a balloon, Well, that's the story for after the show. Information for this episode was sourced from Slate, Mental Floss, Wired, and more links, which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This week on Trivia Tuesday in the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook, Jeffrey said the only African country to have Spanish as an official national language is Equatorial Guinea. Also, fun fact, it does not cross the equator despite its name. Glenn said Canadians purchase more ice cream in the winter than in the summer. John said he learned Waffle House has their own record label, and he put a link to the video about this record label in the comments, which I'll add to the show notes. But you can also find it over at the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook, where you can leave your own trivia and have it read on the show every week. This episode is brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind, who also get full access to the scripts of these episodes before they go live. And a big thank you to Dan Lefebvre of the Based on a True Story podcast for becoming the newest executive producer. And thank you to Heather Welch from Sunshine and Power Cuts, who just upped her monthly Patreon pledge, so she's seeing the very early beginnings of a new project I'm working on exclusively for Patreon supporters at $5 a month or more. The full list of executive producers can be found at the storybehindpodcast.com slash executive producers. Thanks for listening. So you want to know why helium makes your voice sound like this? Well, quick TSB after story. Helium is quote-unquote lighter than air, meaning it's less dense than the air we normally breathe, which is why it's used in balloons to make them float. Because of the lower density, when you inhale helium and talk, your vocal cords produce your voice by vibrating the air going through them. And when helium fills the vocal cords, your voice can travel much faster. Even though it sounds like the pitch of your voice is altered, it's actually the tone that's affected, and the frequency is higher. And although it's fun to do, it can be dangerous when your body doesn't have access to enough oxygen for the lungs and blood. All right, back to the outro music. 